Hey guys, this is Rick. It's spring 2019 and I thought it would be appropriate with a small market update of the no bullshit assessment type. Uh, in 28, no, in 2011, I started doing these with something I called four drivers and four hurdles for Bitcoin to overcome. The funny thing back then was that I didn't even mention scaling as a hurdle because you know, of course we're going to raise the block size limit as we're approaching it. It wasn't even in, in, in the world of possibilities that this would become an obstacle, much less a religious cult. So, Bitcoin in 2019, spring of 2019, we're always hit, trying to hit a moving target. So we need to be running toward where the ball, ball is going to be rather than where the ball is at the moment. Onboarding opportunities and onboarding challenges are shifting subtly and have shifted after 2017 in particular. So here's what I see at the moment. We used to be going for merchant adoption of Bitcoin, whole sale, as in you would be able to spend your Bitcoin at all the big places like Steam and Amazon and Microsoft and so on and so on and so forth. And this was a good onboarding strategy. This was a good front bowling pin. There was a real business case here because you'd circumvent the credit card company's fees of 2-4% to 4 straight off the top of every transaction. The business case here would be that the merchants would have a natural incentive to offer discounts in Bitcoin. So basically passing on the savings of the credit card company's fees onto the customer. So the customer would have an incentive in their turn to buy expensive items using Bitcoin. And from there, you would gradually grow the ecosystem to gradually reduce conversions to and from fiat. This was the idea. This was a solid plan. This was a solid front bowling pin. It has failed. It has failed. And that's because of the 2017, frankly, fuck up on the behalf of Bitcoin Core and the utter denial and delirium they're still going through. Because, however, in this onboarding scenario, the cost and the effort of Bitcoin acquisition is rated as zero. It's assumed to be a zero cost. And that's not the case. There are several costs, very real costs, acquiring Bitcoin. There is the exchange fees, which are in the range of 0.15%, 0.25%. Might not be much, but it's still a very real cost in terms of dollars. There is liquidity spread losses. If the highest buy order is at 990 and the lowest sell order is at 1010, then you have a 2% spread loss right there. Now, these liquidity spread losses have been decreasing lately, but Something like 990 and 1010 is not an uncommon sight in Bitcoin after fast mar market movements. And I mean, th that's a 2% loss right there, eating the entire savings of skirting the credit card companies. Last but not least, there's the bank transfer fees to exchanges. These are frequently enough international transfers, costing on the order of five, six, seven, eight dollars and as we'll see later, upwards of $50 in some cases. In addition to this, there's also several efforts acquiring Bitcoin. There's the whole learning curve of what is this stuff anyway, which is cause for stress, cause for anxiety, cause for uneasiness. There's the opening of an account at an exchange and going through the whole identify yourself process, which not only takes days, but is a whole lot of unfamiliar territory as in what are, what's happening right now. Which brings me to the last really soft part, but which is significant. 
there is a lot of waiting and hoping involved in using Bitcoin for the first time. And this is a very real hurdle that should not be underestimated in terms of the first time experience of doing this. So the point here is that the sum of all the costs and efforts involved in acquiring Bitcoin, some of which are purely emotional, must be visibly and considerably less than the hard monetary gain of using it. This is not just a this number is smaller than this other number, so therefore this smaller number wins. This is a soft and fuzzy thing where people must feel comfortable. And it's not just there at this time. Pre-2017, it was plausible that we'd come to this point for expensive goods that would otherwise have been purchased with credit cards. It looked like completely on rails to get there. And then the block size limit hit and fees spiked and the incompetent morons in charge at Bitcoin Core were popping champagne at the market failure of their own product and the failure of the scenario which would have been the front bowling pin of building an ecosystem. So today, the existence, the very real existence of $50 fees in 2017 make the value proposition going forward absolutely ridiculous in terms of merchant adoption of skirting credit card fees. And this is not the case with Bitcoin Cash, we know this, this is just the case with Bitcoin Core, but even so, the soft costs of customer support with these fee levels went through the roof in 2017. And that means that as of today, we're dealing with a damaged brand. Because the people in charge at merchants have tried Bitcoin and they were hurt by trying Bitcoin. That means that the obstacle to retrying this is actually higher than to trying it for the first time. That means we need to start looking at other market opportunities. Fortunately, there are other market opportunities, and this is where I'll, I'm going with this presentation. To begin with, sp we're talking about spending Bitcoin, but why would you exchange money that you've earned to spend it at a lesser value? It doesn't even make monetary sense much less so if you also involve the efforts like hoping for the best when trying an exchange for the first time, waiting for days, hoping for a response, is this a scam, have they taken my money, and so on and so forth. We've all been there. We've gone through this. This is what new onboarders are going through, and it's not good enough. People in charge of Bitcoin BTC are frankly delirious. Some people are saying that $2 is not a high transaction fee. Well, $2 is what some people have to live on per day. These are the people we were trying to bank the unbanked. And I'm disappointed. I am very disappointed in this delir delirious denial that's going on. And I'm not even making this up. Just yesterday, there was a meme posted on Twitter comparing $2 to the cost of international wires from US banks. And when, uh, when you're looking at this chart, people were actually arguing that the $2 was considerably less than sending international wires from banks, thereby immediately ignoring four things. Ignoring first, nobody uses international wire transfers, like ever. If you're asking a US citizen how often, how often they would use an international wire, the average amount would be zero, or at least the typical response. Disregarding that fees will spike right back to 50, 500, $5,000 if usage climbs, because the basic problem 
that there is a limited, fixed, artificially capped supply of transaction space has not been addressed. There's <laughs> the third problem, which ridiculously is that in order to use these Bitcoin transaction fees of $2, then you need to make an international wire in the first place to an exchange. So you're still hit by this $50 fee in addition to the $2 fee, which will climb to $50 and $500 and beyond. And last but not least, if you have $2 transaction fees, people will just say, fuck that. Simple as that. Nobody's going to pay $2 to make a simple everyday purchase or even the odd purchase of something more expensive. It's just too in much in your face fuckery of nickel and diming. So, some people have come up with this other use case, which is censorship resistant money. Isn't that a great use case? Sounds all buzzwordy. Sounds like you're on a moral crusade to liberate the world, aren't you? And to be fair, it is a great use case. Censorship resistant money is a great use case for the following potential users. To begin with, you have Wikileaks. Wikileaks was on a financial blockade from MasterCard and Visa, so they couldn't receive donations. Bitcoin came to the rescue and skirted this censorship, thereby giving us the first example. Um, Aaron, I think the list is cut off here. Is there, an, is there an error? Oh, wait. This is the entire list. Oh, okay. Yeah, so WikiLeaks is the entire list of potential users. And I mean, if you're looking at a potential market of more than two people, Julian Assange and Sarah Harrison, yeah, more than two people out of seven billion, then maybe this isn't your best potential market approach. I would argue that you should have a better market a better potential market than two people out of seven billion. There is an alternate front bowling pin. There is an alternate front bowling pin. And that's realizing that Bitcoin begins with us. Bitcoin begins with us. Most of us are running small businesses. There are really annoying pain points in running small businesses with all the authorities that think that your business model is filling out their paperwork. That's what you do for a profit. We've all seen this. Further, I had the privilege and honor of hosting Mike and Jake of CoinSpice.io here in this Berlin apartment. And we had a very nice chat and, uh, and they made the point that the key to having Bitcoin succeed is not the ability to spend Bitcoin, but the ability to earn Bitcoin. Your wallet has to be refilled by something you need to spend. Just the ability to spend something that you're gaining in a different format doesn't really bootstrap the economy. You need to earn Bitcoin in order to bootstrap the economy. That means that small businesses must start paying wages in Bitcoin. And this is a pain as of today because there is no administration tools to do it. So I've been working on something that might help with this. I've been working on something as undeniably sleep-inducingly boring as an accounting package. I hate accounting. I despise it with a passion from the bottom of my guts. I want to strangle the damn thing. 
but I still need to do it because of these authorities think I make a profit by doing fucking accounting. And I think most people can relate to this if you're running a small business. I'm writing a, an accounting package that's compliant with the old world, that's presenting results in terms they want, like the presentation currency of the ledger in this accounting package is a central bank currency that the authorities expect, but it's operating in Bitcoin. It does real-time accounting for currency fluctuations and presents in old world currency, but it operates in Bitcoin. It pays invoices in Bitcoin. It receives invoices in Bitcoin. It pays wages in Bitcoin. I'd like to compare to another service here, which is Expensify. There's lots of pressure in the IT world in general and the block space world in particular to hang out with the most exciting projects, like this Wednesday afternoon's darling. I want to work on Avalanche or on proof of stake in Ethereum or on pre-consensus or on what have you. Expensify was addressing a real pain point that was boring to work on. But everybody thought it was boring to do and they hated it. Their very simple business was expense reports that don't suck. Because that was the only kind that existed prior to Expensify coming online. And expense reports in the corporate world have been around for centuries. Still been done the same, same way. And along comes Expensify and actually makes them not suck. Makes them, even if not, maybe if not enjoyable, at least bearable. And so what I want to do is small business administration that doesn't suck. Small business administration that doesn't suck. Something that looks compliant to the old world, but operates in Bitcoin. And I'm hoping to present more of this later this year. Subject to the normal breaks of life. For example, <laughs> I loaded a small game the other, the other day called Factorio. And you know, when you're loading up a small game and suddenly you're distracted by something and remembering to look down in your watch and it's already the next morning, Factorio is kind of like that, except I was distracted by something and I was looking down on my watch and it was already the next month. So, like I said, subject to normal breaks of life. But, pilots of this system have identified some pain points that are being ad addressed. I'm very grateful to these pilots and people daring to install it and see where they run into unexpected behavior. Something like just trying an install in a way I didn't anticipate or a default MySQL install not behaving the way I anticipated when making the installer three versions ago or, you know, things like that. And, I mean, if you want to contribute to the co contribute code or user experience to this system, all the better. It's called Swarm Ops at this point. It'll have a different name, more focused on accounting later. And there's going to be a link in the description here just, just below to this. As I said, this is, you know how it works when we're developing code. I'm, al I'm already using this for production, but I want some more features to be in there before a lot of people see this and start using it, because there are still some pain points there. I'm using it for production. If you want to help more people use it for production, I'm not going to turn that down. Because... And this is the key here. Only when we are running our businesses in Bitcoin will we be able to explain why others should too. And I believe that we can start running our businesses in Bitcoin and spread the ecosystem from there, starting to accept invoices and send invoices payable in Bitcoin. And like ripples on water, spread the ecosystem from where we are. We can start changing the world, starting with where we stand today, where we literally stand today. 
as opposed to taking credit card payments for Bitcoin conferences, which is a real thing, which is absolutely bloody ridiculous. This is a faucet moment. The faucet was a company making mechanical calculators, as in you would type in a number on a typewriter like surface and you were crank a lever and this mechanical calculator would come up there is the result of the calculation for you this was a real thing the company making these or one company making these was called faucet and even when they were using electronic calculators internally for their own budgeting did they deliriously think that there would still be a market for mechanical calculators if you're taking credit card payments for a Bitcoin conference, you're in denial. This is what we have to break. I think we can break this. I think we can break out of this cycle. I think we can start changing the world beginning with where we stand today. But we cannot convince our world to use Bitcoin if we aren't ourselves. And I want to be a part of making that happen. There's still a window of opportunity. If we can make Bitcoin work for small business, there's a whole 3 billion people out there that can run small businesses unbanked without doing lots and lots of paperwork. 3 billion people. That's a market. That's the size of market I think we should be gunning for.